Welcome everyone. My name is Kath Albury. I'm Professor of Media and Communication at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne. I would like to respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which Swinburne's campuses are located in Melbourne's east and outer east, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'm honoured to recognise my connection to Wurundjeri history, culture, country and spirituality through these locations. And we at Swinburne strive to ensure that we operate in a manner that respects and honours the elders and ancestors of these lands. We also acknowledge and respect the traditional owners of lands across Australia, their elders, ancestors, culture and heritage, and recognise the continuing sovereignties of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. And I'd like to respectfully welcome all of Swinburne's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff, students, alumni, partners, and visitors, and all of the Indigenous people who are joining us today in this webinar. Um, this is the first of a series of events that um, I will be running uh, through the auspices of my Australian Research Council Future Fellowship, which has started very recently. Um, I am looking at digital literacies and data literacies in the context of sexual health. And um, the point of difference, I guess, for this project is that I'm trying to think about what digital literacy and data literacy means, not as an individual attribute, um, but what it means in an organisation or in a community. Um, if we're thinking about um, literacies or capacities or capabilities um, around digital technologies or data, um, how can we think of those in relation to culture? Um, how can we think about them in relation to policy? How can we think about them basically in relation to how organisations think about themselves or, you know, the way we do things around here? Um, and to think about that in relation to sexual health in the Australian context, at least, I think is um, pretty new and in some ways um, maybe coming a little late in the game, but maybe not. I, I have the good fortune to be um, a bit of an outsider in the space of sexual health in some ways, but with a foot in that camp. And, and so I'm really grateful to be kicking off um, my research process and um, for years of what I think will be really um, interesting and exciting collaboration with people in Australia and across the world um, in such a um, great company as uh, we have in the panel today. I've been really grateful that Heather McCormick, Jen Power, Daniel Readers and Andrea Walling have been able to join us today um, to really have um, a, a uh, in some ways unstructured, in other ways, I guess it's going to be very rich because of the experience of, of our four panellists, a, a really um, provocative introductory roundtable. Um, we're very sorry, Barry, Shannon sends their apologies. They are in the um, nasty stage of um, a COVID infection today and are coughing too much to join us and they will join us in a, in a later conversation. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the framing of the conversation today before I hand over to the panelists, but just to give a bit of a context for this event. It is very much a round table. We're going to be very open to questions um, from the rest of the participants here today. I know the webinar um, format makes it a little hard to see, but there are actually 51 of us um, uh, attending today. Um, it's a really diverse group. Um, I'm just scrolling down the participant list. There are a lot of academics, but there are a lot of um, people from the space of um, uh, health service provision as well joining us today. And so what we're hoping is we can have a, a, a very lively interdisciplinary conversation. Um, the project that I am running um, focuses on young people and, and traditionally my research has focused on young people, but it is not focused at all on school-based sex education or the children. 
Um, and that in itself, I think, is a bit of a novel thing in the Australian landscape for thinking about sexual health and sexual learning. Um, it is part of the Australian STI strategy um, to think about young people as a priority population, but often I think um, in practice, the funding and a lot of the research in this space is channeled into school-based sexuality education. What I'm really interested in in this project and, and why I've invited these um, great scholars and, and practitioners is thinking about um, 18 to 29 year olds who are in the quote unquote young people category within many Australian sexual health policies, but are, are often um, kind of underrepresented in the, in the nuanced conversations we might have around digital technologies and their role in, in sexuality and well-being and sexual health. Um, I also want to think about what might count as good practice or bad practice or best practice in this space. I'm not asking anyone to job in um, any particular organization, by the way, we're not going to drop names here, but um, the, the do's and do nots of this space. Um, obviously digital health is no longer a novel space and yet it very often is um, treated as if it's novelty or innovation. I also want to think about who might be left out of current service provision. Um, I know that um, the, the ways that trans people and gender diverse people are included or excluded from um, the space of public health is a very raw issue right now. Um, I also um, am very grateful that Heather is here to talk about the Take Blackshin project um, from New South Wales Health because um, thinking about the ways that Indigenous people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here in Australia are and are not included in um, really um, careful and culturally appropriate health campaigns and also health, you know, clinical health service provision is a very um, intense question right now. There are real challenges in relation to funding and we don't know where things will be going after the elections, both state and federal that are coming up right now. And um, Heather's practice is, is such a leader in this space and, and her colleagues as well. I'm, I'm very pleased that she's here today to speak to that. Um, so that is enough rambling from me. Um, I will hand over to uh, Heather um, and I will ask her to introduce herself and to respond to one of my provocations or maybe both and I'll just reiterate those for the audience. So my provocations for the, the panelists were what kinds of tech are 18 to 29 year olds currently using to explore their sexuality, health and well-being or and or what do we currently know about good practice in digital sexual health promotion? Um, and I'll let Heather introduce herself and speak to those questions and hopefully share some content with us. Thanks, Kath. Um, I'm Heather McCormack. Uh, I am a senior program manager at the New South Wales STI Programs Unit, which is part of the New South Wales Ministry of Health. Um, and I'm a Wiradjuri woman. So um, my portfolio at the STI Programs Unit is a, a bit of a weird mix. I, I lead most of our Aboriginal programs, but the other half of my portfolio is kind of communications related things that don't really fit with anyone else's um, body of work. Um, so Take Blackshin is a um, sexual health promotion communications campaign. Um, targeting Aboriginal young people aged 15 to 29 in New South Wales. Um, and this campaign came out of early findings from research we did at another one of our projects that was based at music festivals. And that research found that Aboriginal young people were less likely to report condom use than non-Aboriginal young people. But what we thought was much more significant was that they were much less likely to report that they thought their friends used condoms. So as we know, these, these kinds of social norms are a really important influence on sexual behaviour. 
and shame and stigma are massive barriers to use of condoms and access to sexual health services for Aboriginal young people. So all of this kind of helped identify the need for an Aboriginal-led campaign in New South Wales to empower Aboriginal young people to take charge of their sexual health. So the core components of Take Black Action are high-profile comedy ambassadors, comedy sketch videos and activations. And I can usually see some eyebrows going up when I say that and people are like, comedy? That, that doesn't sound what we were expecting. Um, but comedy has a really long history within Aboriginal media. We see this really uniquely Aboriginal sense of humour across written fiction, theatre, comedy skit shows like ABC Black Comedy, where some of our ambassadors first hit the public eye. And when it's used effectively, humour can diffuse the discomfort that surrounds sensitive topics. So what I mean by that is that it can sometimes be easier to talk about different topics if you can, di sorry, difficult topics, if you can have a laugh about them. So Take Black Action uses this uniquely Aboriginal humour of the comedy ambassadors to kind of get around shame and connect young Aboriginal people to relevant and appropriate sexual health promotion messaging. Um, it's a partnership between the New South Wales STI Program Unit and the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council of New South Wales, and the creative is developed by an Aboriginal media agency and the project is overseen by an Aboriginal advisory group who provide really diverse regional and frontline perspectives. So, great campaign, funny videos, how do we know it's working? We've used a few different measures for evaluation for each of the different components. Um, it's predominantly a social media campaign, so we can look at coverage, reach, engagement, likes, shares, things like that. So far, the campaign has exceeded KPIs on reach and engagement every year that it's run. And our content continues to reach more young women than young men. But we do have a really sizable minority of young men viewing our content, particularly on Instagram. They're just much less likely to engage with the content or follow the page. Um, but that engagement, getting people to engage with sexual health content, it influences those social norms that I mentioned before. Just seeing friends tagging each other and commenting helps normalise the conversation around sexual health. But performance on social media is a pretty easy thing to measure, but we need to dig a little deeper to find out if we're actually getting the outcomes we want in the target audience. So other things we look at are our website traffic, um, especially completion of key engagement activities. So, for example, on our website, we have a, um, a service locator where young people can put in their postcode and find a bulk billing doctor or Aboriginal medical service near them where they can get a free STI test. And we would record that as an intention to test. Um, we collect some basic data at the community events that we run, so engagement, resources given out, things like that. Um, and in year two, we commence some survey collection with Aboriginal young people in collaboration with the Centre for Social Research and Health. And those surveys formed the baseline of an ongoing evaluation where we're measuring changes in attitudes and behaviours. So the evaluation survey launched at the end of last year's campaign, which was year four. And it's a longitudinal tool that aims to compare trends in sexual beha health behaviours and attitudes related to condom use and STI testing. And we're looking at both a cohort of people who were exposed to the campaign and a cohort of people who were not exposed to the campaign. So that's a bit about what Take Black Action is. What I think has made it successful um, the, most, the most significant factor is that it's Aboriginal-led. It's Aboriginal-led on every level. We have an Aboriginal media agency. It's a partnership with AHMRC. It's an Aboriginal governance group. And the ambassadors are high-profile community members as well as celebrities. The Aboriginal creative agencies have been really essential. They know our audience. They have real insight into how they use media and how they interact with these topics. And they're able to engage them in a really meaningful way. The Aboriginal advisory group made up of Aboriginal sexual health workers from around the state have really um, useful local knowledge and community connections to be able to guide the project. Um, and of course, the ambassadors are really well known and liked. Um, they've all gone above and beyond sharing the content, attending events, bringing so much energy to the campaign. They are influencers, but they're also, as I said, high profile community members. So they're involvement and endorsement is really valuable and 
it enables people to feel more comfortable engaging with the content and therefore contributing to that normalization of conversations about sexual health. And finally, I'd say the adoption of a strengths-based approach throughout the program of work. Aboriginal young people hear a lot about how disadvantaged and disproportionately affected by various negative things they are. So we made sure that the, cone of, the tone of Take Black Action consistently emphasised community strengths. We don't want to make people feel bad about themselves. We want to challenge the shame and stigma around sexual health and get people thinking creatively about how they can look out for their own health and how they can look out for the health of their partners. Um, so I'm going to try now to share a couple of the videos from the last couple of years of Take Black Action. Um, we did a little practice of this before you guys joined. So let's see if it's going to work. I've got two. Parks. Crabs. Sandra. Uh, uh, that's me. Oh, good. Well, follow me. Go get tested, you mob. Don't make a big song and dance about it. That's one, and now I'm just going to do that again. This is not the smoothest process. Here's another one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. If your mom were looking for some interaction, the kind that brings love satisfaction, take a moment before you take action, play it safe and Take black shun. It ain't a joke when having a poke to risk an STI that can make you folk broke. So take a moment, think of what's worth spoken. Take black shun, be strong for folk. What are you doing in our room? Yeah, we're trying to have some alone time. Ah, ah, hey, ya. hey! Take black shun, black shun, black shun, black shun, black shun, black shun. Wait, condoms, 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 condoms. condoms. Get tested, tested, oh. tested, 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 tested. Get out, 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 out. Okay, 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 okay. That was weird, eh? Yeah. Catchy tune, though. Mm, true, eh? Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 so yeah, let's take Blackshin. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, folks, I, I uh, wanted to say to everyone, um, we will have um, plenty of discussion and conversation later on we do because we're using the webinar um, platform for zoom not the meeting one we have the separate q and a box so feel very free to put questions in the q and a um, but also you can raise your hand when we have question time later and um, uh, paul who is our fantastic host will um, give you access to the mic um, thanks again, Heather McCormick. We will have heaps of conversation about that very shortly, I'm sure. Um, but before we do, I will invite our next panellist, Jen Power, to offer her insights slash provocations. Thanks, Kath. Um, it's a little bit hard to follow that because I, I feel pressure to be funny, but um, I'll just go with what I'm going with. Um, so my name is Jen Power. I'm a researcher at the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society at La Trobe University. Um, I am speaking to you from the well, wondery land of the Kulin Nations in Melbourne. 
Um, and I would like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging from across the country. So I wanted to respond to Kath's question, uh, what do we know about good, uh, good practice in digital sexual health promotion? Um, and I'm gonna speak a little bit broadly about that um, and probably covering ground, which many of us have thought about, but I just think it doesn't hurt to just remind us that the way in which uh, we evaluate or think about or make sense of good practice in digital sexual health promotion fundamentally comes back to the ways in which we understand sexual health or the ways we define sexual health. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with the World Health Organization definition of sexual health, which emphasizes a holistic approach to sexual health as being more than the absence of disease and uses terms around a, a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships and the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination and violence. So it's a very broad term. It's a very social term. Um, it refers to, you know, sort of big uh, structural rights um, and structural freedoms. Um, and it's been noted many times that that definition is quite widely cited in approaches to sexual health policy and programming and practice, but it's a very uh, difficult definition to bring into programs. Um, and most often funding for sexual health programs is quite clinically um, sort of determined or it's come through a health organization or, or government health department. So often the, the points, um, that we're trying to address in programming or in evaluation of programs um, are things like contraceptive use or STI diagnoses or you know, so-called behavioral changes such as use of condoms or STI screening. And why that's fine, I think it doesn't necessarily um, capture the breadth of what we're often trying to achieve when we're talking about sexual health or best practice sexual health promotions, particularly in this digital environment. Um, but of course, that takes a much more complex approach. You know, bringing in that holistic definition takes a much more complex approach. So fundamentally, if we're trying to define good practice in digital sexual health promotion, we do need to think quite broadly. And, but I do think it's important to articulate what outcomes we're looking for, uh, what is good sexual health, and what do we assume are the changes we might be able to, by, what are the changes we're looking for in digital sexual health promotion? What do we assume this might be able to achieve? And also what is digital sexual health promotion? Like what is the nature of this, this practice or this intervention or this um, approach to sexual health? So I wanted to talk about that because at Archers, uh, we recently conducted a study um, to, to explore these questions. It was, so when I say we, I mean Andrea and I and some of our colleagues. Um, uh, we were talking to young people so including people under 18, but also up to 21. So it's sort of um, it's slightly younger than the cohort you're talking about, Kath, but I think the issues are still relevant. Um, and certainly we're talking about sexual health promotion outside of the school-based format or forum. So I thought I'd share a few thoughts and insights from that project. Firstly, when we interviewed young people, so for this project, we spoke to Young people, we also spoke to some key experts working in sexual health promotion or who are producing uh, digital content for young people. Um, we found that asking questions using the terminology of sexual health tended to elicit a focus on quite clinically based information or information based resources. So information about SEIs or information about contraception or where to get a test, uh, which is fine. But when we asked about sexual rights, and of course, sexual rights is quite intimately connected to, you know, the achievement of sexual health, certainly using that broader definition, um, we got quite a different perspective. And I guess by asking, I mean, not just asking participants, but also asking ourselves, you know, if we look at the data that we're collecting, what is it telling us about, um, or, or, or what do we see if we apply this lens of sexual rights rather than sexual health? So that helped us to shift our focus from the concept of, of I guess to think more broadly about the different forms of online content or online engage engagements that relates to sexual health or constitutes uh, digital sexual health promotion practice. Um, for example, a campaign for better consent education in schools using an online petition 
led by a young person, which was very high profile a couple of years ago, is a really excellent example of digital sexual health promotion, or perhaps of the potential for digital media and digital connectivity to support sexual rights and sexual health. Um, and I imagine we could find more examples of the ways in which digital media is being used to support sexual rights in this way, and more examples of where young people, and by young people, I mean up to 30, um, or up, just go up to 40 for young people, um, just finding examples of where young people are leading the way in digital forums. And I know, Kath, you've certainly had that sort of counter public health approach and, and online connectivity in your radar um, in your past work. And I think if we're talking about kind of research to identify good practice in digital sexual health promotion, you know, we might be looking at questions like, you know, how does something like this, you know, sexual rights campaign actually then go on to perhaps support young people to feel more confident in navigating uh, sexual relationships or in having conversation about conversations about sex and rights, or perhaps, you know, sort of more broadly developing a sense of sexual agency. And then we might sort of understand, I think, more about the potential for online research, resources or digital sexual health promotion to support sexual health. The other thing we found in this study, um, well, we found lots, but one of the other things was um, about the way the online environment supports the development of sexual literacy. So we see in the online environment that, you know, there's simply a, a really large volume of resources related to sex and relationships and sexual health. Um, and there's a whole range of formal and informal resources or content, um, and there's a lot of different mediums. So, you know, ads like the Black Nation um, sort of short video format, ads, TikToks, podcasts, websites, um, YouTube, um, through to things like more formal uh, websites, information-based websites and apps. So the sheer volume of, sorry, the sheer volume of information, the different types of resources and content really encourages people to do what you do online and follow rabbit holes, go down the rabbit hole, follow different lines of inquiry, think of different things, you know, seek information. So there is a, people are learning online. It, it's a really excellent forum for people to learn about sexual health. So I do sort of wonder that when we're talking about what is good practice in terms of digital sexual health promotion, actually encouraging or recognising the way people are already searching for information using digital content is a really important part of that. But the other thing that's come up in our research and other research is the fact that when people go online to learn anything or to investigate, I guess, anything to do with sex or relationships or sexual health, they're rarely seeking information in the abstract. It's sort of, it's quite different to a classroom where a particular curriculum is being delivered. People are usually seeking info that's quite specific, quite relevant to them or sparked by an issue or a problem or something that's come up in their life or a question that they've thought of, something that, that, that's you know, relevant to their life. So people might engage with sexual health information resources about STIs or contraception or whatever else, but usually people are actually looking for stories uh, that are relevant to their own experiences, looking for people who post similar questions on forums or whatever, um, or looking for images or scenarios or videos or something that reflects their own life or helps them engage with understanding something about themselves or the experiences that they're going through. Um, and I think this is really important for thinking about digital sexual health promotion, but also thinking about this definition of sexual literacy. So literacy is not just about knowledge of sexual health or what does an STI look like? This might be part of it, of course, but really good health literacy and sexual health literacy is about being able to apply knowledge to one's life. Um, I noticed there's a few people in the attendance list who would have heard me go on about this before, but I will go on about it again. I often use the example of the feminist health book that came out in the 1970s, Our Bodies, Ourselves, to talk about the definition of sexual literacy, because I think it's a really good one. So if you're not familiar with that book, it was a book that was written by feminists, targeted towards women, um, and really focused on sexual and reproductive health. And this book really did teach women about things like contraception, but it also encouraged them to reflect on their lives and reflect on their sexuality and their relationships and reflect on gender relationships more broadly. It didn't just provide info about contraceptions, but although it did do this, it also encouraged women to wonder about what it might mean, for example, for a married woman to be on the pill, what freedoms this entailed, what, might, what barriers might lie ahead, 
you know, for them in terms of negotiating that with doctors or with their husbands. So it encouraged thought, it encouraged reflection, it encouraged action, it encouraged agency. So I often think of that as a really good, that book as good sexual health promotion practice for women in the 1970s. And I do kind of think that in 2022, it's possible that digital media is achieving something similar. I say possible, because I think it's less clear cut than one book and the internet's many, many different things. Um, but I do think the online environment does facilitate access to content that encourages that sort of reflection because people are looking for information that's really specific to their, read, their needs, information that encourages reflection, encourages learning about oneself encourages someone to be curious about their lives. And I, I'm sure many of you would be familiar with um, the sort of large volume of image-based resources that have been created by disability sexual rights activists, you know, showing people with um, physical disabilities in sexual clothing or sexual scenarios, sexualized images, just to counteract this assumption that people with disabilities are, are not sexual or don't have sexual desires. Um, and I think that sort of resource could be really important for some people in terms of developing sexual agency or understanding their own sexuality um, and plays a role in sexual rights. It plays a role in sexual literacy using that definition of understanding oneself and, and sort of figuring out how to apply knowledge about sexual health to one's life. So sexual literacy as not just sort of an A on a test or a state of knowing, but about having the confidence and resourcefulness to understand information, to seek information and to reflect and draw from knowledge. So I think that the online environment actually is, is doing this to a certain extent. What we need to do is better understand how and how that connects with um, the way people feel about themselves, the decisions and the practices um, in their sort of offline lives, I guess. Um, so research which helps kind of understand the ways digital, the digital environment supports sexual literacy, I think will help us build an understanding of best practice digital sexual health promotion. Um, I've got more to say, but I'm gonna stop there and hopefully. <laughs> yeah, leave, leave us in suspense for now. Thank you so much for that, Jen, because we, we will have a chance to come up to, come back to all of these issues. And one of the reasons, um, I'm a bit sorry that Barry isn't here today is I think one of their really provocative conclusions um, in their recent book was that, um, you know, we've put a lot of time in, and energy into uh, seeking to reform school-based sex education um, and maybe it's irredeemable in terms of helping people understand their lives and their experiences in the ways that, that you... Um, have described there not not because there is not goodwill in that space. There's wonderful goodwill, but there are, there are so many systemic blocks that, in fact, um, it may be time to look towards some workarounds in this space. I mean, I know, and and I I will not go into it now. My my colleagues in the Centre for Automated Decision Making and Society and myself, um, including Joanna Williams, who is here today, are, are looking at the ways platforms can make these processes quite difficult for organizations that are seeking to work in the online space. We won't have that discussion today. Um, but the role but, of explicit content, I think, is relevant. Yeah, well, it doesn't It doesn't have to be explicit, unfortunately, to be shut down by content moderation. And that's, that's the question that we're looking at right now. It yeah. just needs the wrong keyword, the adult keyword in it. Um, but we will, we will move on um, to our next panelist. Um, uh, I, I'm very sorry we can't all be in the same room today for this conversation, especially given how many wonderful people are participating um, in the audience, but I am super pleased that we're on Zoom because it meant that Heather and Daniel can be with us today, so I will hand over to Daniel Readers. Thank you. Thanks, Kath, and hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the Gadigal land, um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation up here in Sydney. Um, I'm a queer non-binary person with disability and I've been a practitioner in HIV and sexual and reproductive health for coming up on 20 years. Um, my first project was way back in 2003 and it was setting up uh, an online community for people who wanted to talk about HIV and sexual health um, in the queer communities in Melbourne um, back when digital was still legitimately kind of a new thing. 
Um, I describe myself in my bio as a academic um, because I've been a research fellow on three different projects looking at hepatitis B, peer-based programs and the National Disability Insurance Scheme. I'm also a PhD candidate in regulation and governance at the ANU. Um, and I have a real passion for thinking about engagement and that's what I'm going to have a bit of a rant about this afternoon. Um, typically we think about engagement as something that an organisation does. So it's an organisation centric view of engagement. And in my PhD, I try to kind of mix that up a bit by asking um, not how do we engage with the communities, but how do communities engage in order to reconfigure the regulation of illicit drugs like HIV medicine and illicit drugs um, like crystal meth. So I have two case studies in a digital ethnography of what I'm calling interstitial movements. And they're movements that kind of emerge in an established field of players and try to reconfigure the relationships among them in order to achieve a different outcome for the regulation of the issues they care about. Um, and that emerges out of my interest as a health promotion practitioner where we're very often trying to engage with what the Australian researcher Michael Hurley called cultures of care. So they are cultures of everyday practice. Um, you might think of the gay community negotiating HIV during sexual practices. Um, and we're interested in um, the media circuits and the cultural practices that sustain the outcomes of interest in this case. In Michael's era, it was the use of condoms. And in our era, it's the use of PrEP and U equals U. Um, however, when we're talking about engagement, there's a real risk of uh, talking about abstractions. Um, and it, the abstractions that we constantly use include the term culture, um, but also the term population. Um, it includes reach, it includes audience. Um, there's a real danger of using this kind of nearly metaphysical language of airy fairy abstractions that, that cover over or obscure what it is we're actually dealing with. Um, so I wanna make one point two ways today. And the, the first point is from a practitioner perspective and it's about the importance of organizations maintaining an ambient present in digital cultural spaces and not just engaging when you have an intervention or a research project that you want to promote. Um, and I can think of a couple of examples, actually three examples. Uh, I'm thinking of Shine SA, who do sexual and reproductive health work in South Australia. Um, Our Watch, who do work challenging domestic and family violence, particularly among young people. Um, and more recently, the Australian Electoral Commission of all the institutions have been doing a really fabulous job on Twitter of participating in what people call the discourse, capital T, capital D, um, sharing content, engaging in replies, retweets, quote tweets, um, to really establish themselves as a player in that discursive space. Um, so that when people come to them with a question, they have a brand, they have a following, they have a, a network of existing relationships that they can call on in order to engage with people and disseminate information. And that's crucial at a time when there's no shortage of state and non-state actors engaging in disinformation, whether for strategic purposes or just for fun. Um, all of these different organisations are engaging on sensitive topics um, and they're very conscious of the need to tread that fine line between promoting what they do on a day-to-day -day basis in everyday language, using relatable, that terrible word, but relatable content um, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, when they need to, um, being able to share what can be quite pointed, crunchy material about really sensitive and difficult topics. Um, there's a process of building up trust, not just with the audience, but also with the platform and the algorithm that happens when you're present in those spaces in an ambient sense and that you, when you're not just showing up because you have a study that you need to recruit for. So now let me make the same point in more technical researchery terms. Um, and I'm using here some thinking from Jenna Burrell and Jessa Lingell um, that I've drawn on in my PhD research. Um, and they think about a, a really similar abstraction similar problem of abstraction and that's the notion of the field. So you have ethnographers 
in the old days, the field was a literal village or community site and you would show up and you would put down um, kind of roots and you would stay there until you had finished studying your project. Um, these days, when we look at digital ethnography, the problem of setting a boundary around the field, of deciding what's in and what's out, how long you're going to be there and when you're going to leave, that all depends on the researcher making decisions. Um, and they propose the concept of uh, networked field studies as a way of thinking through those difficulties. Um, the point they make is that you can't really engage directly with a digital culture except via relationships and circuits that you have done the work yourself to establish over time. And in a digital field site, the only necessary connection between the different objects that you might be studying is often the linkages that you have created yourself as the researcher. And I think that's a really useful way of thinking about engagement in digital sexual health promotion as well. Um, I had the experience last year of working on developing an engagement strategy for the Victorian Department of Health in the aftermath of the Nine Towers lockdown when the Public Health Intelligence Unit at Department of Health realised that they needed an engagement strategy to rebuild trust with the culturally and linguistically diverse communities that had been affected by the lockdown without any notice and without any wraparound support of nine public housing towers. Um, so great that they recognised that there was a problem there. Um, and my contact was a very concrete thinker, and I say that in the best possible way. They insisted that we have to think about engagement as something mediated via specific personal relationships. That you can't just talk about the department engaging with the community, that instead you have to be specific about who in the department and who in the community and how are they connected. And I think that's really good methodological discipline. Um, it has been for my PhD and it is in my practice trying to engage with digital sexual cultures. So uh, the one thing I would note about that though is that uh, whereas my friend and my contact working on that project insisted that engagement is personal, in my PhD research I'm also looking at the network of both human and non-human actors that, uh, that is implicated when we try to engage with a community or regulatory space. Um, so those non-human actors can be um, quite mystified in the case of the algorithm that we're constantly talking about, um, but it can be incredibly mundane. So the login switcher for Google Apps has turned out to be a key player in the chains of association that mediate engagement in my digital field work. Um, whenever we say, would you open this document here, you suddenly have a Zoom meeting or a Google Hangout full of people going, oh, it says I don't have permission to access that. And then we have a five minute conversation about, okay, you're logged in as one Google persona and you need to switch to a different Google persona and that will give you access to this document. Um, other very basic things, like as a person with disability, um, I'm both neurodiverse and um, I live with uh, cognitive disability. Um, the scroll interface in the Facebook app is a non-human actor that I am constantly wrestling with in my attempts to engage with the kind of materials that I'm talking about. So it's really valuable to think about when we're engaging. It's not just about personal relationships, but it's those chains of association between people, non-human objects and the different kinds of networks that we're engaged with that really um, determine whether we succeed or fail in those engagement attempts. So that's my rant. That's really all I wanted to say about engagement. Um, but I'd really welcome questions about how we can practice this differently um, and what are those points of intersection between research and practice when it comes to this kind of engagement with digital sexual cultures. Sorry, I had a few days off work and I forgot how to use the mute again, the non-human actor comes to the fore. Um, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, really um, thoughtful um, and thought provoking, I think. And I will invite Andrea 
Wiling then to respond. Um, sorry, as an A, I always feel really bad about doing things in alphabetical order because I know, especially when there's a W on the bill. So sorry, Andrea. <laughs> the next thing I do will be reverse alphabetical order. Um, yeah, I'm going to restrain myself from responding to Daniel because I would say too much and I want Andrea to have her time to shine. So Andrea, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, just a very quick note, I'm speaking on the land of the Rwandji people of the Kula Nation and like to pay my respects um, to elders past and present. I'm going to have a bit of a provocative discussion today. Um, to give a bit of a background, I'm a ARC DECRA fellow based at the Australian Research Centre in Sex, Health and Society with Jen, and I'm currently leading a project that's exploring cisgender heterosexual men's understandings and engagements with sex intimacy and thinking about sexual communication, consent and sexual health. So I'm working with a population group that is often not normally a target of sexual health promotion um, and for very good reason. And so I wanted to answer the question around what is good practice in digital sexual health promotion for this group. Um, and my answer is it doesn't exist at the moment. Uh, and I'm going to kind of explore why that is. But I also don't have an answer as to what we can do. I'm still trying to kind of figure that out myself. So I don't really have a way through it. And so I really welcome some ideas or suggestions or kind of discussion around it. So. One of the things that I've been realizing in my work on kind of young cis het men, and this includes kind of work with expert stakeholders, I've also worked with this population group, and this includes policy and practice, sex education workers, and gender violence prevention, groups that work with boys and men's kind of sporting groups as well, is that cis het men have a really interesting visible invisibility. They are so visible in our, our society. We're very aware that cis het men kind of are dominant groups in our society, particularly white cis het men, particularly able-bodied cis het men. And because of that, they, they have such a presence that we don't often actually think about them when we think about deficits, when we think about needs, when we think about resources. And that is, of course, for very good reason. It's, it's very aware that there are other groups in Australian society and elsewhere that actually need our resources, that need our attention, that need our support. So what happens is we have a group that seems to be doing okay, that's kind of trolling along, that don't really need any support because they're already a dominant group. And what happens is we're actually missing some really important opportunities to engage them in sexual health. And that actually, to me, has really important implications and consequences, for example, how we're thinking about sexual violence, how we're thinking about gender violence, and how we're thinking about violence towards other groups that experience at the hands of cis het men. So for example, violence towards um, queer people, towards trans women who might sleep with cis het men and so forth. So we don't include them. And when we do include them, we have a tendency to focus on very specific deficit areas, such as their pornography use and concerns around pornography use. We look at whether or not they're using enough Viagra. We kind of come at it from a very pathologized place, from a harm reduction place or a violence place. We look at whether or not they've got sex addiction. We're looking at whether or not there's good or bad representations of their sexuality in the media. Or for older men, we're really focused on prostate and testicular cancer, even though young men actually are at very high risk for testicular cancer. So these are kind of the ways in which we think about men. And we've kind of missed some really important opportunities. And some things that I've been kind of looking at in that is that there's a lot of gaps in our knowledge about what we need to do to get men engaged and how to go about it. And some of those include things like we don't really know how men are dealing with unwanted pregnancies. Again, for good reason, unwanted pregnancies disproportionately impact people who can have a pregnancy over men. They're the ones who are going to have to go through what it feels like to have a pregnancy, may or may not have access to pregnancy termination, may be more likely the ones to have to care for the child and so forth. It's the same for infertility experiences. It's the same for sexual violence. It's the same for accessing sexual health information. Because we understand sexual health information is already constructed within a narrative of heterosexuality, we kind of just assume that men are getting everything they need. Um, and that's actually just not the case. And we know that, we know that from the fact that most of them actually, and in the research I'm doing, have no idea how to navigate sexual communication in a really kind of positive and affirming way. They don't really know how to engage in 
multiple like mutually reciprocal and, and pleasurable sex with women they don't really understand how to have a difficult conversation about navigating sexual health whether or not they should talk about using condoms using birth control and so forth so there's a lot of kind of little gaps that we're not really talking about or thinking about and this is really challenging because it's really difficult to address these gaps but not redirecting resources where they need to go. And I, that's where I don't have an answer is how do we address gaps for cis men without redirecting important resources from other groups that need it. And one example that I've been seeing in my work, for example, um, sorry, one thing that I've noticed in my work that I've been doing with young men in particular is that we have a really large discourse at the moment about consent and consent education. We need to get consent education in schools. We need to get it in digital online spaces. We need to really talk to young men about sex and consent because they don't know how to um, understand consent. They don't understand what it looks like. They don't understand how to have a conceptual encounter and this is gonna address sexual violence. And I've recently done several interviews with young men asking them to describe for me those sexual scenarios and sexual situations in which they're engaging in consent, in which they're engaging in sexual communication. And they are very aware of what it looks like. They're very aware of what the body looks like when it's not consenting. They're very aware from the minute details of breathing patterns, of the way the skin looks, the way the body reacts to touch. They're incredibly aware. And so that tells me that we need to really maybe rethink this idea about consent education, particularly in a later age, because if they're already aware and still in engaging in violations, is consent education actually going to do anything? Or is our approach to consent education actually going to do the work that we needed to do to address sexual violence? And I don't think it's going to if they're very aware. And the only exception to that are men with neurodiversities that I spoke with. So for example, someone who, um, talked about their experiences of autism, had a very different experience of that and that they very much needed the verbal confirmation of consent during a sexual moment. But for those who um, identified as neurotypical, they're incredibly aware. So that's why I'm very cautious about some of the approaches that we're talking about now to try and get men engaged because I don't think they're going to do the work they're going to do. On the other hand, I do think there's some things that are starting to happen that are being effective that we need to think about. So for example, in the 2009 to 2018 National Update on HIV, Viral Hepatitis and Sexually Transmissible Infections in Australia by the Kirby Institute, it noted that there was a 300% increase of reported syphilis infections among cisgender women. And that suggests uh, an increased heterosexual transmission. And so while we know that syphilis can be transmitted between women, it's a much rarer occurrence. And what I found when I'm talking to expert stakeholders about that, as I said, well, we don't really talk to men about STIs or, S or STI transmission. We don't really engage with them about it. We kind of just say use condoms, but most contraception, most reproductive, most kind of sexual health stuff around the use of condoms is, a, is based in contraceptive. So it's based in reproduction and making sure you don't get your partner pregnant. It's not really taught, it's still kind of not really based in an STI framework when we're talking about cisgender heterosexual relationships. And so what happens then is that the burden of responsibility of contraception still falls on women. And that's also from a long history of control of women's bodies around the use of hormones, around kind of controlling their capacity to get or get or not get pregnant, which has had you know, amazing leaps and bounds in terms of rights to liberation and bodily autonomy. But the downside means that men don't hold responsibility at all for contraception and, and they're continuing to not hold it. And the men that I spoke with in my study they often just assume that she's on birth control and then they don't use a condom and they don't even think about STIs. They're not thinking about STI transmission. They just assume that if she says that she's clean and I hate that language, but if she says she's clean and hygienic, then as long as she's on birth control, we don't care. Um, and that's a real concern. And I think where something is working is that we know that in 2013, HPV vaccination was included for, for cisgender men that, that could take it. And that actually was seeing a really important reduction of HPV um, and genital warts diagnosis among this population group. And that's really important because if we're seeing a decrease in diagnosis among men, um, particularly men who have sex with people with a cervix, that actually has potentially re really important implications for people with a cervix of a reduction of that STI um, and the possible uh, development of cervical cancer, which is a very serious development. So when men are not really included or when they are included, 
there's a lot of uncertainty. And in a lot of the research we know, they're also not really learning about how to have sex. We know that RSC isn't really doing that kind of job. They're looking to pornography. Some pornography can be really helpful into showing the bodies and providing reassurance. And as we know, some of it is not, some of it can be very violent and may not actually demonstrate the kinds of sexual activities that they want to engage in. And I feel like I'm kind of going on a little bit of a rant and kind of have lost my place a little bit. But I think what my point is, is that Gender power is still very much present when we're talking about this population group. And I don't actually have an answer is how do we, how do we have effective engagement that is effective and is doing the work of sexual health promotion, but it's also actually addressing some of the, the, the kind of greater, bigger gender power things that sit underneath what it means to be a cishet men engaging in sexual relations with women or with women with trans histories. What does that actually look like and how do we address that? How do we shift the conversation and narrative to make men responsible for contraception and to take responsibility for contraception? How do we shift the narrative that they're having those conversations with the people they're going to have sex with around safe sex? How are we gonna get them into testing? Because they're often the least likely to go get tested and they're the least likely in clinical settings to be asked to be tested because there's less of an, uh, an organic opportunity to actually talk to them about, well, you're here, you've got a cold, why don't we go and get you tested? It's a very different conversation too if you've got a young, a young person, for example, who experienced menstruation, they might be going to get access to birth control and the doctor might say, oh, you might, are you interested in getting some sexual health testing as well? There's a lot of kind of discrepancies around that. Um, so yeah, I think that's my main point is that I think when working with this population group, there's a visible invisibility and I don't know how to address it. And I don't know what that looks like for good sexual health promotion, but I, th I think we need to start and we need to start in a way that continues to um, lift up other groups and population groups that actually really need the resources, need our attention, need our support, but we can't leave this group behind even if they are a dominant group in our society. Awesome, thank you. Um, and thank you, Andrea, you were not off topic at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Um, thank you to all the panel. Um, we've got some comments in the in the comment thread. I'd like to invite um, the people who are here with us today also to um, put a question in the Q and A or um, ask a question um, by raising their hand. If if you raise your hand, um, Paul will um, put you on mic. Um, so I'll let you have a little time to, to think about that now. Um, can I ask first though, does anyone on the round table panel have a, a response or a comment or a question for any of your fellow panelists? It's like, oh, now we're on the spot. Okay. Well, in that case, um, I, I would like to kind of do a little reflecting. Um, as I said, my, uh, my project that I'm taking forward, the selfish reason I've invited everyone here today, and I have been soaking all this up and I'm really looking forward to, to um, going back to the transcript again after, after this presentation and, and both the transcript and the recording will be available after this presentation, subject to um, the, the roundtable participants' approval. Um, one of the things that, that really interested me in my project was what I saw as a kind of fade away in conversations around sexual health. And that's why I, I appreciate, Andrea, that you really pushed that to the fore. The, the increased rates of gonorrhea and syphilis in Australia, just it, it's just unthinkable to me that this is happening now. Um, and, uh, you know, I know there's a pandemic on and we've got other stuff to, to think about, but uh, I, I wonder, um, why there is so little focus on sexual health right now outside of sexual health organizations themselves, which as we know are, are kind of sketchily funded and very much on the front lines and kind of uh, lurching from project to project. We've got a question from the group. I'll, I'll leave that kind of observation there because I'm as kind of outraged and bemused as you, Andrea, on that point. Um, there's a, a, a question from the audience. How do we encourage research 
that is not just extractive, but also empowering in that participates, uh, participants, I should say, also directly benefit from research. I know many of you have done that kind of work. So um, I'll invite um, anyone to respond first around research practice and partnership that benefits participants. Um, I'm happy to, to have a yeah. stab at that question. Uh, on some level, I, I find that a difficult question to answer without falling back on the really obvious things that we all sort of say about the importance of community leadership and community participation and Certainly in the HIV sector, we, we use the language of meaningful involvement or meaningful engagement of people living with HIV in research. And I think that's a really important term. Um, like, like, what does it mean to have meaningful engagement? Sorry, I just want to put a loud heater in. Um, you know, meaningful engagement or meaningful involvement of community isn't just about consulting, you know, on the survey design or consulting on how to promote the study. It's actually about um, understanding and I think valuing different forms of knowledge. So really understanding and appreciating that people from a whole range of different experiences bring important knowledge to bear on a study. So actually, you know, bringing a whole different, a whole range of voices to a table um, means you all learn something and that your study improves and is better as a result, it's not just consulting community for the sake of, you know, the, the, the politics of it or to, to, you know, show or demonstrate that you've consulted with people, but actually researchers understanding how much their project can be improved with different insights and experiences. Um, and also sort of, you know, trying to, to I guess, locate research questions around, um, Sorry, I'm going to go on a little rant as we keep on saying, I think it's a tricky question because often if you go in and say directly to um, say a community organisation, what are your immediate needs? They'll be able to talk about program evaluation. They'll be able to talk about what sort of informational needs they require to support advocacy or funding submissions. And all of that is really important. But I also think there's a role for researchers. And, I've, um, you know, and I think we see this again, drawing from the HIV epidemic, um, or the, the sort of research response to HIV, there's a role for researchers in really pushing thinking. For example, pushing thinking around, you know, what public health or health promotion or sexual health promotion might be. So if you look back to the history of HIV, we had these amazing researchers in Australia who introduced this idea that public health research was about understanding community, was it about understanding connection was about understanding some of the things Daniel spoke about before, such as, you know, um, networks of care, the way in which people look after each other, the way in which sexual um, uh, networks, in this case, particularly of gay men, were about promoting ideas or promoting conversations about use of condoms or sexual health. And those networks were key to shifting um, cultures so that safe sex was normalised. So um what what those researchers did was sort of shift the way we approach public health research in general to being a sort of humanities focus a community focus not just a clinical question um and that i think continues to be really important and really relevant sorry i, I hope i'm not losing you i think my point is i don't always think it's really obvious and I, I don't want this to sound like I'm saying, well, you should trust the researchers, they know best. I think there are many questions that might end up in the long term being really important um, in terms of things like funding more creative approaches to health promotion. Um, but they might not be the obvious, this is what we need in the immediate moment questions. Does that make sense? Um, the whole point is it's a really, it's a much more complicated question than I think is immediately obvious once you really delve into it. Daniel, can you jump in? I can. Um, I'll be really quick because I would love to hear um, Heather's perspective on this as well. This yes, is I was thinking of, of the, what you said about question. constituting your campaign. So, Heather, so I'll, I'll yeah. yeah, Daniel and, and then Heather, thank you. Um, I work at the National Association of People with HIV Australia, which is one of the main clients, as it were, of Jen's research on the Futures study. Um, Futures is a uh, um, a study that happens every two or three years, I think, of all of the people with HIV in Australia, um, 
as many of them as it's possible to recruit. And we realized at NAPWA that we were missing a key group in that study sample, and that was um, positive Asian Pacific Islander men primarily, um, but uh, people generally. Um, and so I think that, that my initial answer to that question of how do you ensure that research is not extractive is you need to have people in a position to be a little bit difficult when the moment calls for it, to get in a researcher's face and say, in this case, it was a very polite conversation with Jen saying, hey, here's an issue. Could we address this with a different sampling and um, research data collection method? Um, and Jen being the wonderful person she is, immediately saw the problem. And um, through a network called the Positive Asian Advocacy Network Australia, um, began uh, recruiting for in-depth interviews, people from that undersampled group. So you have a group that's too small to make much difference in a statistical analysis, but that meant that those in-depth interviews were infinitely more informative than what we had before about the needs and experiences of that group. So it's kind of a success story of um, identifying where research was um, missing a kind of key population that we were really, we thought it was really important to reach and a really nice collaborative partnership for addressing those gaps. So to come back to the point that I'm making, if the community can't make life difficult for the researcher, then it's probable that there isn't meaningful engagement. And I'm not gonna name them, but I can point to surveys that haven't changed their methodology in the past 15 years. And they're really just generating the same results year after year after year. And they're still missing out on those key populations whose experiences and needs are not represented. So yeah, that's kind of my question as a practitioner is, are the researchers willing to be vulnerable? Are they willing to let you come in with difficult questions that make their lives in a methodological sense a bit more difficult um, in order to ensure that the full diversity of the population is represented? And I think, are they willing to turn up? Ambient presence yes. and building yeah. really long-term relationships are really relevant yeah. here too. Fantastic, yeah. thank you. I, I would really like to hear from Heather because um, you really carefully stepped us through the way your campaign was constructed and, and it, it, it seems very carefully um, put together in terms of an engagement. And I'd love to hear some more about that. Um, sure, I do have a bit of background noise going on, so I hope that's not too oppressive. Um, on research, so this is something we hear a lot. Um, Aboriginal communities are heavily over-researched, and a lot of them have really bad relationships with the entire concept of research. Um, and it's something I hear a lot from non-Indigenous researchers saying that um, the non-Indigenous researcher is researching Aboriginal people as a study population, investigating a question that the Aboriginal researcher wants to resolve. And how can they more meaningfully consult with Aboriginal communities um, to you know, make their research more culturally appropriate? And, I would argue that there are, you know, several false um, assumptions in that line of thinking. Um, it might be a radical position, but I'd say we need to reorient entirely so that research about Aboriginal people and communities is Aboriginal-led and focused on Aboriginal priorities. Um, we so frequently see the, the meaningful Aboriginal engagement being consultation with um, advisory committees or organisations or um, at best you've got, um, you know, Aboriginal people engaged as peer research assistants. And while I think all of that is very valuable, um, often non-Indigenous researchers can't really answer the question of why they haven't engaged Aboriginal people on their own level. There are Aboriginal researchers, we're all over the place. Um, I think Aboriginal research needs to have Aboriginal leadership and 
part of that is like a, a, a really kind of radical shift to get non-Indigenous researchers to think of Aboriginal people not just as data points and stakeholders, but as colleagues and experts. Um, and I, I think when people are consulting the Aboriginal community as, as experts and colleagues and um, potential leaders in the research field rather than as an exercise to get through ethics. That's the only way we're going to see meaningful change on this front. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question from Caitlin McGrain, which I will read out for people who can't see the Q&A. Um, and I, it, it's long, so I'm going to kind of cut to the question a bit, but there is awesome praise for you in it, Andrea, also. Um, Andrea, uh, it's a question uh, about um, your interviews. So you, you say that the men that you spoke to kind of knew about consent already. Did you get the sense that they were open to learning more or did you suspect they were telling you what they wanted to hear? Um, I'm about to start a project working with, uh, looking at online harassment, working with young men. I'm thinking about how I talk to and work with men and boys, uh, um, thinking about problems that, as you say, are deeply implicated with gendered power. Yeah, it's a really tricky, tricky one, actually, working with men in any of these spaces. Um, the way I actually approached the interviews was, it was I, I had them describe to me an encounter a kind of step-by-step -step encounter. And through those description, I asked them to tell me about the feelings associated with them. I asked them to describe body positions. I asked them to describe, you know, how did you know if she was enjoying it? How did you know if this was working? What was the kind of signal for you? And, and then I asked them to describe what was not enjoyment or what was not a signal. Mm -hmm. So even if they were telling me what I wanted to hear, that still tells me that they know what it is and I think that's the sticking point is that it it, it doesn't matter actually in, in a way if they're just kind of repeating verbatim it means they have the knowledge and so if they have the knowledge whether or not they're engaging that in practice is, is the other question and, and I, I have to go I don't know if they're actually engaging it in practice I'm not in that moment with them there always has to be a bit of a disbelief around it or we have to decide, are we going to believe them on their terms? Or are we not going to believe them on their terms? Which, which is a whole kind of methodological issue to deal with when you're working with anybody, particularly cishet men in the space of gendered power, of sexual violence, all of that. But you kind of have to, you have to go in, if you go in with the knowledge that if they're what they're telling you, regardless as to whether or not it's what you want to hear, they still have it. So then that means that they know at, on some level what like right or wrong, for example, is and whether or not they, and then we know on the other side of that, that most women, for example, for talking about women will have experienced the wrong side of that. So you kind of have to kind of make those kinds of connections. Um, in terms of learning more, they were interested in learning more, you know, if I asked them questions about sexual health around, you know, some of them didn't even know what HPP was, they had no, or not H, HPV, sorry, yeah, HPV, sorry, HPP is a forestry plantation. Um, they didn't know what that was, they didn't know you could get a vaccination for it, they didn't really have much knowledge around STIs, they didn't really know much about birth control, they kind of just thought all women had to take it, like I had some men who didn't even realize that some women didn't take it and they didn't have an understanding as to why you might not choose to take it or the impacts of it. They didn't understand the side effects. There's a lot of stuff they didn't know that they were open to learning, but when it came to communication and consent, they were very, very articulate about exactly what, what is a consensual encounter and what isn't. So the real question isn't whether or not they know about it, but actually what are they doing in that practice? Are they choosing to ignore signs of rejection, to ignore signals that might be nonverbal? Um, which I think is what's happening. Sorry. Yeah, it takes us, and uh, we won't rant on this, but Daniel yeah. and I have had many fist shakings around awareness campaigns in the mm -hmm. past because it, it's it's very clear um, in in this area, as in many areas, that the issue is not awareness um, yeah. at all. It's <laughs> yeah. quite a confronting thing to think about, though, isn't it? Like, yeah. I feel like the... The, the answer that oh, the, the problem is that they just don't know and if we educate them, then that will fix it. Like that, that's kind of a comforting idea. Um, 
and it, it's quite confronting to realize that we might be looking at something much more complex and a bit darker. Yeah. Mm. And it's also, I think, in a way, also reproduces the inherent in unequal power dynamics within that. If we continue to frame men as not knowing or needing educating, then we're not holding them actually responsible. Um, yeah. And that's what we need to do. But that's not what's happening. We've just shifted into, a, oh, we need to educate and they'll be fine. Mm. They're still doing it. <laughs> Yeah, I worked as a researcher on one of the Victorian um, government inquiries on sexual offences law reform in the mid-2000s, and that was not a life-enhancing experience by any means. Um, but it was really clear even back then that um, this account of accidental rape, of mm. cishet men not knowing what they're doing and not being aware of the possibility of their partners not consenting to sex was... The dominant way of explaining the majority of sexual assault um, and that, that's a key defense so it shows up a lot in um, legal cases in prosecutions for sexual offenses um, but so it has kind of taken over in public discourses that the main explanation of why sexual assault happens and it points in this really misleading direction towards sexual health promotion and sex education as the ways to stop rape. Whereas uh, if we follow the more holistic definition that Jen presented, then they're really important as ways of having better sex, but they're probably not the key mechanisms that we should be looking at for sexual assault prevention. Yeah, exactly. Great, thank you. Um, I, I will um, just say there's about 10 more minutes, folks. So if you are a participant who's not on camera um, but, and would like to um, ask a question of the panel or um, offer a reflection uh, or provocation of your own, now is the time to please um, pop your hand up or, or put a question in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to slightly shift back a bit um, to, let's make it about me again. I'm going to slightly shift back a bit to the topic of the Future Fellowship, which is less about um, uh, what we might teach outwards from, um, uh, from a sexual health organization or a, a clinical service or a, a research organization, but what we might learn um, ourselves as researchers, as clinical practitioners, as sexual health promoters. Um, the question for my project is what does digital literacy look like within um, a sexual health organization rather than, and, and, and this question I should say arose from um, collaboration with some great organizations here in Australia over the years as a researcher, um, sometimes working uh, on the development of campaigns or advising um, on the development of campaigns, sometimes in other kinds of conversations, but a sense that um, for many organizations um, digital culture seemed like a scary or novel thing that was happening out there. Um, if someone in the organization knew anything about it, it was because they were the young person who'd just been hired and they were supposed to be the embodiment of knowledge because they were the so-called digital native, as if such things exist. Um, and, uh, there was very much a sense that the organization's um, perspective was that this was a site of risk. Um, if there was a social media policy, the policy around social media was about, um, you know, conduct and reputation and, and not bringing the organization into disrepute. It was not about um, the kind of ambient presence and, and the, the role of the organization as a, as a um, participant in digital culture that, that Daniel spoke about so compellingly. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I see we've got another question. So um, I will follow up with that in a minute. But um, yeah, I, I, I wonder if each of you might give a kind of brief response about how you see your, um, the kinds of insights that you've offered today reflected 
back or reflecting in the research and practice cultures that you're engaged in. And I know, Heather, you're, you're very much engaged in digital culture in your work, so I might ask you to go first. Sorry, I was reading what the question was and I got a bit lost. <laughs> I, 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 was, I was thinking about um, how does your... Um, what is your sense of the ways that health organisations or health promotion organisations understand their own digital literacy in this space? Yeah, so this is a bit of a complicated one for me because while I work in a leading sexual health organisation, it is a sexual health organisation that is part of government. And there is a, um, a level of risk avoidance that comes with being part of government that um, to an extent non-government sexual health organizations can distance themselves from a little. Um, so I mean for example with the uh, Take Black and Sister project Play Safe which is our um, uh, youth program that's targeted a, a mainstream youth audience um, we got memed we um, ended up in a bunch of Jimmy Rees content, um, um, kind of memeing about how ridiculous it is for the government to be telling you to have sex. Um, and that's, that's obviously something that is very much on the minds of the people who are approving all of our content, um, approving our strategies, approving our, our, the ideas about everything we want to do. Um, so... We have to be really clear um, that everything that we're putting out has a really clear health message attached to it um, so that we can, we can feel confident that the people who have signed off on it are not going to come back to us and go, well, why did you um, put out this content that's obviously just about sex and not actually about um, STI testing or condom um, use? And... Um, we've had some luck in recent years about weaving some content in that's focused more on healthy relationships and female empowerment. And we did that in direct response to comments by young women made during our evaluation. Um, but there's still like we, we have like a, a fairly strict set of criteria we have to meet in order for our content to be endorsed. And sometimes I look at the sexual health content that's being put out on social and digital by some of the NGOs or some of the peer organizations. And I'm just like, oh, I would love to have the freedom um, that you appear to have with your messaging. Um, I feel like we're very lucky with Take Black and that the incredibly positive response the campaign has gotten and the, um, the, the strong feeling of ownership that the community has over it um, has meant that we have a bit of flexibility that a lot of government campaigns don't have. Um, but yeah, so that, um, that question about sexual health organisations, use of digital communications is a little complicated by the overshadowing government context for me but um yeah maybe the the digital literacy is the organization having to understand things like being memed is part of the game yeah. part of the process and you've got to yeah. relinquish a little bit of control there for that for yeah. it's effective actually and I guess it's that the um the people who are making the content and deciding that something can be brief for approval um, we have to have a good enough understanding of the, the digital context that our users are existing in to, to know that if, um, you know, we get called on to provide a rationale to the health minister because something has ended up on the front page of the Daily Telegraph, that we can do that in, um, in a manner that provides adequate rationale and justification for the decisions that we've made and they've signed off on. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, that's really, yeah, very, very succinct and, and very much pointing to um, one of the big issues in Australia right now, that, that, that funding issue. And I, and I was recently involved in a project where we were, um, we were writing the evaluation and we were saying, oh, well, can, can we say it's a great thing that we didn't get stoner sloth? And it's like, uh, we didn't get stoner sloth <laughs> yet. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just wait and see, <laughs> because yes, being memed is is 
I would say, part of the terrain. Daniel, you've got your camera, uh, not camera, sorry, mic on. So I wondered if you had a, a follow up uh, comment. So that is entirely accidental, but I'll have a crack. Um, I've been the young person a very long time ago who was assumed to be a digital native. And um, it's a terrible model because you take a person who is structurally disempowered in every possible way and then tell them that they're responsible for this thing that could be mission critical to the organisation. Um, I, the advice I would give these days, uh, uh, talking to program managers or organisation managers, is you need to hop on TikTok. You, there is no substitute for getting your feet wet in the digital spaces that your organisation is going to be operating in and just getting a sense of what's normal, what the possible risks might be, how people manage those risks when they eventuate and kind of take it from there. That was beautiful. Thank you. You, you gave the actionable um, ad advice for the manager there, which is that that is the sign of your 20 years of experience. That's um, so appreciated. Thank you. Um, look, thank you, everyone, for a great chat. I really do pine for the olden days where we would be all in a room and say, you know, maybe we'll go and have um, a lovely mocktail or a glass of wine now and talk some more in an informal way. I do hope the day will come when we can all be in a room talking about this informally. And, and to all of you who've joined us in the webinar today, thank you very much. We really appreciate having you here in, in um, the sidebar that you are, the list of names. Um, we could have talked a lot longer here, I think. It was a, a wonderful group of panellists and and everything that I could have wished for as the first formal event for this um, four year project. Um, thank you very much for coming today. We will have future events. People who are here today, we will um, share updates. And, and yes, there will be a recording of this event and a, a transcript once I check the um, AI version of the transcription for accuracy on the Center for Automated Decision Making and Society's YouTube channel. Um, in a few days. Um, so please um, let's do the, the virtual um, Zoom applause for everyone here today. Um, thank you and I look forward to seeing you all again.